then we'll go to the next topic and introduce a team from not far away. So welcome on stage, the Volvo team. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Yeah, we have been expanding uh, and last uh, time we presented at Open Infra, I think we peaked at, yeah, not so many changes. Um, so these are some stats from uh, recent dates. And you can see here we have around 3,000 Gerrit Patchets each day. And these are the pipelines that we run in Seoul on our big VCC tenant. And these figures are something we have displayed before and we have compared with other operators. And I think two years ago in Berlin, uh, I stood on stage and said, yeah, we peak at 10,000 jobs in each 24 hours. And I was pretty like impressed, you know, like, oh, this is nice. And one of our managers asked me uh, in the beginning of the year, yeah, how much are we building now? And I, I haven't checked, you know, I haven't checked for a while. And, oh, it's peaking at 20,000 20, builds each 24 hours. So we're massively expanding uh, our Seoul usage internally. And because of that, uh, we need to look at how we scale Zool. One really fun thing that has developed uh, quite recently is that we got a, a namespace at OpenDev. So we're publishing um, an open source project. Uh, this is quite a small thing, but it's very beneficial for us. It's called Powertrain Build. It's a build system for embedded ECUs. Uh, where you can easily transfer code between POSIX systems and classical embedded systems. And when we thought about this, you know, we, we looked at, oh, but we need a CI system for this. And we can't really use our own that we use for our source code internally in the car. So OpenDev kindly provided that we can have our own tenant too. And I think we, are, yeah, we have the team working with it here in the audience, but I think we're quite close in uh, pushing the first uh, changes to this repo. Yeah, so now to the real topic. Tommy, please. Mm. Thank you, Johannes. Um, <clears throat> yes, as you can see, Seul is a quite powerful tool, and it is increasing in size, and um, we have been working with uh, Carpenter lately, which is a node provisioning tool um, for the auto-scaling, as Johannes mentioned. So, why now? Well, at Volvo we have quite big initiatives now to make Seoul the central or the standard CI tool of Volvo. So we need to prepare and we need to set up a complete auto scale of our cluster. So to do that we need to have node as well as pod auto scaling. And Carpenter will help us with the node auto scaling. <clears throat> so in our previous setup, we had static autoscaling, where we, um, it worked fine since we were just monitoring the system uh, manually with uh, Grafana and Splunk alarms. And whenever um, we saw any slowness or anything in the system, we could just scale up and boot up new nodes. Um, however, we used instance templates for that. So. Um, Whenever we booted a new node, it was quite large and led to underutilized nodes. And these nodes could take up to a minute to launch. But with Carpenter, however, we can have flexible node provisioning. So we can give Carpenter a, a variety of nodes which um, Carpenter can choose between. So um, based on the resource request from the pods you uh, boot up, the Carpenter will choose uh, whatever node fits per, uh, for that resource request. So as an example, we have a node pool here where we have configured uh, uh, what type of node uh, the Carpenter should choose between <laughs> for the specific services. And I have highlighted here the instance category and instance family, which defines what type of nodes should be deployed for this type of uh, uh, pods. <clears throat> and so b based on the uh, unscheduled pods in the, uh, or Carpenter's working 
uh, like it's looking at the unscheduled pods in the system to see what are the resource requests. And then it looks at the configuration to see what matches that uh, resource request. And it boots up a node with a perfect fit. And on top of that, uh, you get less monitoring required since Mo Carpenter is um, monitoring the system for you. Uh, so <clears throat> um, less maintenance for that. And, and last, lastly, but not least, you get, it takes seconds to launch new nodes since it's working at the Kubernetes level and looking at uh, the pods, uh, the unscheduled pods for the resources uh, requested. Uh, so no decision making or any manual uh, work there. So with this we get resource efficiency, less maintenance, and speed. And so how did we implement Carpenter? Uh, well, we wanted to have a decreased risk of affecting the SUIL core. And in our previous setup, we had a similar uh, approach where we needed a separation of the workloads. So we had two node groups, one for SUIL services and one for non-SUIL services. And we did a similar approach now with Carpenter. So we set up three groups of nodes, two node groups uh, with Carpenter, um, but, um, one dedicated for SUIL and one for non-SUIL services. And uh, on top of that, we added a cluster node group for Carpenter itself. And that was because Carpenter controller became such a critical service for the cluster, so we had to isolate that completely from everything else. And to enable that, we used taints and tolerations, as well as node affinity and pod anti-infinity. I also want to mention load balancing when talking about Carpenter because Carpenter really requires a proper load balancer. Um, <clears throat> with our static autoscaling setup, we could, uh, <clears throat> we were running a self-managed EC2 based uh, Nginx and <clears throat> we could just reconfigure that when uh, we spun up new nodes or terminate the nodes and route the traffic, but um, with Carpenter, that's not possible because Carpenter is changing the nodes in the cluster continuously. So it needs to be updated instantly. Uh, so a proper load balancer is a must. So we set up a AWS network load balancer on our cluster and complemented that with the ingress nginx for ingress control and AWS load balancer controller add-on for the deployment of the load balancer. And we chose this network load balancer because it can set a static IP, which is very beneficial uh, since you don't have to, uh, when you deploy a new uh, load balancer, you don't have to create any new C name or anything. You can just um, set the static IP and it will uh, route the traffic directly. And also it's working at the fourth level of OSI, so it has a much lower latency. Um, and so it doesn't have any payload inspections or anything like that. And it also uses uh, TCP connection, which fit our per, uh, cluster perfectly. So what's missing? Well, as I mentioned in the beginning, we, we need complete autoscaling and Carpenter will help us with the node uh, autoscaling. But to make this complete, we need to have pod autoscaling since that's what uh, Carpenter is using as a base. So, um, and that is what Moist will talk about. But uh, first, he will show you uh, our cloud infrastructure. Moist. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so thank you, Fufus, and thank you, Tommy, for explaining how we uh, use Zool today and how we are using Carpenter to scale up the nodes. Now, let's take a step back for a moment, and let's talk about our cloud infrastructure. Okay, so, so um, basically we deploy uh, Zool on an EKS cluster, um, and, and it's, uh, again, it's a Kubernetes service provided by um, AWS itself. Uh, we use managed node groups uh, along with Carpenter itself, but for Zool, 
uh, we only use Carpenter nodes rather than uh, the node group nodes. Um, we deploy everything through Terraform, um, and we have a separate code base for that as well. Uh, we have a separate code base for modules as well, which we use in our Terraform project. Um, if we talk about um, environments, well, I, I think uh, I should firstly mention that uh, we have um, a bunch of jobs, Zool jobs running. Um, around 80% of those jobs run on AWS itself uh, in form of EC2 machines. Um, maybe around 19% of them run on Azure VMs, and uh, around 1% of them uh, run on um, uh, Kubernetes pods in our uh, cluster, EKS cluster, uh, cluster itself. Um, and we need to bump up these numbers as well. So uh, recently, we've been trying to um, run more and more jobs in Kubernetes cluster, so that's our target right now. Um, coming back to the environments uh, section. Uh, we normally, as every company has, we have three environments. We have development, uh, we have stage, and we have uh, production. Uh, now for these three environments, we have uh, three different types of uh, because we have different workloads, right? We have different type of nodes. Uh, no, those nodes have different resources, resources like CPU, memory, and disk. Um, and then uh, because we have different workload, uh, we have different number of Zool components in dev and stage, and we have different ones uh, in prod as well. Um, so yeah, and we have different um, upgradation processes for the cluster itself and the Zool, uh, Zool images as well. Uh, so again, when we talk about upgradation of the cluster, um, we normally um, just do the upgradation in the dev and stage first, and then we move on to production after we have, after we have done all the testing. And same for the Zool images as well. As, as soon as the new images are uh, available to us, we test them out in dev and stage first, and then we uh, drive them and run them in production. Uh, so this is a small diagram that uh, describes how our infra looks like today. Uh, as you can see, we have three clusters. We have the dev one, stage one, and prod one. And those are spinning up uh, jobs in form of EC2 machines and Azure VMs uh, inside another VPC and inside, uh, inside another VNet in Azure. Uh, so that's what we have right now. Uh, yeah, um, and now uh, I guess you will come and uh, present what uh, we do with Bazel and how we integrate this with Zool. Yes. So we had a, an, started a Bazel conversion project for some of our important uh, nodes in the car, and we have some of the team members here in the audience. Uh, we, I think we are two months in into this project, and so we haven't deployed anything yet, but we are working... Uh, very committed to do this. And this is a rough sketch uh, I did. I won't go into uh, details here, but there are some interesting things here. Uh, and one is that we are planning to use a bare metal server uh, in our, um, connected to our Zool cluster. And here we will launch micro VMs. And uh, we have one developer here in the audience also probably who has worked with that. And that is something that we want or we would like to open source that solution of that micro VM. And that micro VM uh, will, do the, will hold the base job of Zool, and it will have a, a hot cache, uh, hopefully uh, saving uh, what it did last in ROM. And it will do the base limitations in uh, um, remote execution cluster. And at the moment, we have uh, Bill Barn deployed in our cloud for that. So. Uh, why are we looking at uh, Bazel then? Well, uh, as you all know, uh, Zool uses pipelines, uh, check gates, and so forth. And it's, you know, when you have a lot of dependencies between pipelines, um, you easily end up in a, a mess. So the CI system starts to mimic parts of what the build system does, handling dependencies, and so forth. And here, we would like to use Bazel's open source dependency management and remote execution to take parts of what we're seeing in the CI system today in the pipelines and move it into a build system. 
And here is a snapshot. This is just part of one of the important jobs that we have. And I see some of my colleagues here uh, smiling. You know, this is huge, right? And this is a, a generated SUL pipeline that holds dependencies on large scale changes. And you know, this is not ideal. Like you, you, don't, you don't really want to have that in your CS system if you can avoid it. So um, now when we're in the early phases, we're experimenting and we, uh, the team has come up with a solution where the developer seems to be able to have a, a monorepo, but Garrett uh, and the CS system will have a, using the super product uh, subscription functionality and using uh, sub-modules, which are cumbersome, but they can be handling Garrett. And then we are looking on how Zool will handle this so we can uh, ensure atomic uh, changes uh, that we are dependent on uh, in our uh, car infrastructure because not everything is event-based in a car. Some things need to be handled atomically. So this is, uh, yeah, what we're doing here. And I think this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see if there's some questions. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And sorry for screwing up the presentation. No. Uh, and you did, <laughs> you did a fine job actually doing that without the presentation material. Uh, awesome. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, and not to me. Um, <laughs> any questions? There is one question, and I'll throw something. I, but Johannes, you can throw yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Show your skills. Yeah, I might injure someone, actually. <laughs> OK. Um, so first question, um, why did you have to uh, mix Asia and AWS? Was, was there no cloud provider which had everything for you, or? Oh. Uh, Maybe more. So you I, can I think uh, when you when you say mix, uh, what do you exactly mean by mixing everything? No, on the um, slide you showed where you had on the right side the uh, EC2s from AWS and on the left side the virtual machine in an Azure cluster. Yes. So I mean there are also like virtual machines or possibilities in AWS. So is there a specific reason that you used both or had to use both? I, I think it, it really it really depends upon the job that we're spinning up. Uh, some of the jobs that we run in AWS requires. Uh, interaction with services which are in AWS. For, so for those particular jobs, we intend to run those jobs in AWS. And again, for similar jobs that uh, interact with uh, stuff running in um, Azure, for example, we have Artifactory running in Azure. So for those jobs uh, that download huge packages from those Artifactory, it's better to run those jobs as Azure VMs. So that's why we have the, this setup right now. Okay, maybe a second question. Um, so this is mainly used for a build system, or is it also used to manage different test nodes in the automotive pipeline? Like, for example, do you differentiate between seal test, hill test, test beds, and use them out of SUL pipelines? I think that's a question yeah, for you. Yeah, that's much for me. Uh, we're doing everything. Uh, most of it is uh, cloud-based things, like unit tests, uh, compile jobs. But we also have uh, seal tests in different virtual environments. Uh, we have spoken before on, on YouTube, some of the nice uh, like high-level seal things we are running now, where we can run um, you know, the target binaries for the car, actually, in a cloud environment. So we have the, that kind of seal testing. And then we have a small portion of hardware in, uh, I mean, hardware in the loop tests. It's not, I think it's a minute you know, uh, part of Zool, but it still exists. Uh, so we have some of the important um, rigs there. But when we do that, we really need to combine it with other systems like you know, clients and, and so forth, because these, these rigs are quite complex. Uh, so they, they, it's much easier to run um, virtual machines in a cloud. You know? So that's mainly what we do. OK, thanks. All right, I'll take the chance and steal uh, two seconds every time. Uh, so, uh, you know, the crowd here uh, is, of course, using a, lot, using a lot of the software from Open Infra Foundation, OpenStack being a core, I think. I saw Stackit here, I saw Vexos there, I know Clue is here. 
you know, lots of public clouds as well as other, you know, drivers from, let's say, European value pr proposition and so forth. So just out of curiosity, so you guys are driving an open source type of thinking and you guys are a little bit of a shiny star together, I would say, with Ericsson here in Sweden, you know, in, in, in actually utilizing open source and trying to give back to the community in many ways. But at the same time, you know, you jump into AWS, Azure uh, for simple VMs and that kind of stuff, right? Out of curiosity, and I, I think everybody here is sitting thinking, like, what, what makes that choice? Is it just the ease of the flow, as in saying, like, why don't we give back to the open source community and actually using some of the public clouds and so forth? That's one question. And then to you, Matthias, second question here. You know, from a perspective that we're seeing these tech giants, you know, eating into more and more our everyday life, including our cars, including our transportation, and I would say the intelligence of that transportation, um, are, is, is a company like Volvo not potentially concerned of what the future may hold for vehicles when you're kind of feeding these companies that I think potentially could, could be a competitor or a threat in, in one instance. We've seen in the States, for example, right, Walmart jumped out of AWS very quickly once they realized, well, shoot, these people are soon going to start eating our lunch, right? Are there thoughts from Volvo in that sense? So those two, maybe starting with you guys on the, the choices of lack of open source or not. Well, I think we have open source, you know, and even our cloud providers open source some of their things, actually. So, so I don't see, uh, I don't see uh, a tension between that, to be honest. And there wasn't much of a choice, to be honest. You know, you, you work in a big company handling proprietary code. Yep. You know, you take what you get, right? And yep. we were one of the first that actually used um, cloud nodes. And we just took, we had one, yep. one account, you know, this is, what you get, and and before the ease that, of use, and it was a decision, and it just you know, kind of went that well, way. Well, yeah. You know, and uh, you know the the IT department. You know, they they we had we didn't have a lot of choices, and we built our we started on bare metal things we built ourselves. You know, we had a service in the landscape in the office. Yeah. You know, because that's what we needed at the time, yeah. instead of our own data centers. But when we we just took what we. What we got, and uh, it works really well, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Great services, it, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, it, it's you know, it's amazing, and I I think that you know, speaking of AWS, you know, they do open source things that we have that we're using. So I don't see. Um, a conflict. No, it was more the choice, and, and now you yeah, answer that. It's, so it's a great. choice of no, yeah. no choice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I think <laughs> I, I can add to that as well, uh, being yeah. part of, uh, of the evil IT uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I mean, um, we are a, a, a pretty large company. We're a, almost a hundred year old company, so open source is kind of not in, in the genes of Volvo cars from, from the early days. Yeah. Obviously, we all are, are proud of the three point seat belt as we open source that in, in, in general which is quite a big feat, uh, to be honest. But, I mean, we have a lot of like proprietary solutions and cut solutions and built stuff and, and moving. So I think you're actually a, a little bit of a pinnacle of, uh, not a pinnacle, but a, a more of a golden path to where we need to be in order to stay competitive. And then to the second question, um, obviously I'm not the right person to decide what to do with the cars eventually and how we treat, deal with, I mean, Apple tried to build a car or s supposedly tried to build a car. I mean, there's a lot of things more than the actual user interface of a car um, that the Googles and the Apples are not really good at. So obviously we keep track of what's happening in the industry uh, for sure. Um, but there's so much more to building a car than just what you see. Uh, so I think that that's, um, that's my kind of humble opinion at the moment. If you want more detail of the strategy, I think there's someone else that needs to answer that. All right, but thanks, thanks so for much. the question. Are you ready? Cool, any more questions? Oh. There's, w okay, now you have to show your proper skills. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, good. <laughs> so was it top, yes. Uh, by, with the Basel integration, how much of the logic that was in this giant script can you actually get into Basel? All of it. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean a lot. Yes, uh, a lot of it goes into into Basel, and uh, you know uh, I'm struggling to learn it. I'm an, by no means an expert, and it's very verbose. It's 
poorly documented, to be honest. Uh, but you really need to build everything into Basel. You know, if you want to use it properly and you want to use the sandboxing functionality, you really need to use it, uh, uh, and it encompasses everything you do. So, yeah, most of it. But the infra is separate uh, in a way. I mean, you need to change it to, yeah, work with Basel. Um, but you can, I mean, we use, uh, we still have base jobs in Seoul, for instance. But they, they are changed to adopt. Okay. Um, the did you have to, do you have to extend Basel uh, with custom functions or um, to accommodate all of the use cases that? Well, uh, you need to build custom rules and custom tools uh, for it to work. Okay. Uh, that's, the, that's the thing you, you need to do. When there are things missing upstream, you need to build it. So hopefully, I mean, we, we have the, I mean, we just started, but we're already seeing that there are things that we want to uh, put open source as part of the tooling uh, that we're working on. But we'll see. We, I mean, we have to go through a process and, you know, get it uh, approved. But it's getting easier and easier, I would say. <laughs> you know, we see a change internally, you know. When we started this, they looked uh, at us a bit strangely, like, why do you want to put things on the internet? Like, but, but now, it's easier and easier for us. And there's a straight process, there is an OSPO office, you know, and we are actually being encouraged to do this. So that's actually really great. Thank you. Good. And then I think that's it. And are you worried to catch that? Can I just speak up? No, <laughs> because then we can't hear the recording. A uh, quick question. So it's more of a people question. So with Zool being kind of an innovation, let's say, it's not the normal Jenkins that everybody off the shelf knows um, and probably has a smaller learning curve. Uh, when you're trying to add something like Bazel, which is like a giant learning curve, how are you approaching that in internal in an organization where you're like, now you have to get everyone, maybe potentially everyone inside Volvo to learn and understand the Bazel way of doing things, which is not like the straightforward way. So I'm curious how you're dealing with that. Yeah, that's one of the key things we have to look about, uh, look at. And you know, uh, education of the developers is is paramount. And uh, we have one. I mean, we had one. Uh, how do you say? Um, one advantage, and it's that uh, one of our suppliers that we nowadays uh, fully own. They already run Basil, so we. We are using their knowledge and we're porting some of their code into ours and we're using their expertise, you know, to, to teach the developers. And then we are forming um, a central team uh, with the basal knowledge and they will hold the knowledge and be the experts and then, you know, train the trainer basically. And that's what we did with Zool also. I mean, you know, Zool has Ansible and that's some of the DevOps in our community are not really, you know, Ansible users to start with. But what we did then is to train the trainer. So we had the, we let the experts train the expert DevOps out there and then, then train the others. So I think it will be the same with Bazel. We have a central uh, expert team and now we have a conversion team with external experts and those will train the centralized team and the centralized team will then be the like speaking partners to the developers actually. So that's how we plan to do it. Good. Thank you for the question. And now you can walk off stage. Thank you. And Thank you. Uh, and then.